On June 28, 1778, a Continental cannoneer collapsed beside his gun in the scorching heat at the Battle of Monmouth. Depending on the account, he either fell wounded or from heat stroke. At any rate, the gun fell silent. Upon seeing her husband fall, a woman bringing water to the gun crew, who needed water for themselves and the gun, dropped her bucket and, taking up her husband's ramrod, swabbed the gun between rounds, cooling and cleaning the barrel, ensuring it could keep firing. At one point, she had a British musket ball or cannonball fly right between her legs and shred her dress. Unfazed, she stood by the gun until the British retreated from the field and the Patriots won the day. As darkness covered the battlefield, George Washington inquired about the woman he saw swabbing a gun. Molly was quickly found and granted an honorary rank as a non-commissioned officer. The woman would go by the nickname Sergeant Molly for the rest of her life. If all that sounds too good to be true, that's because it probably is. But many Molly pitchers served in the Continental Army, even if history doesn't remember them. We will begin our episode by outlining a brief biography of the three women most often identified as the personification of Molly Pitcher before we settle down to detail the creation of her myth through the life of Mary Ludwig Hayes. After Hayes's short biography, we will talk about the lack of historical evidence surrounding her deeds and the creation and perpetuation of the myth of Molly Pitcher in the American historical memory. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. We've already made a video on the life of Deborah Sampson, a woman who served in the Continental Army under the name Robert Shirtliff, so we're not going to retell her story here. If you haven't yet seen it, go and watch the video about her by clicking the link in the video description below. Margaret Cochran Corbin was born on November 12, 1751, in what is now Franklin County, but was then known as Western Pennsylvania. Her father, Robert, was killed during a 1756 Indian raid during the French and Indian War, and her mother was kidnapped. Five-year-old Margaret and her brother John were not home. After the loss of both their parents, the two were raised by an uncle. We know nothing else about Margaret's childhood. In 1772, 21-year-old Margaret married a frontier farmer named John Corbin. Three years later, John joined the Continental Army. Being a poor farmer's wife, she had little choice but to accompany him as a camp follower. In 1776, John's company was sent to Fort Washington. Margaret followed. The British would attack the fort on November 16, 1776. During the battle, John was killed. By several accounts, Margaret took his post, helping the crew fire the gun until she was hit three times and severely wounded. Like any other wounded combatant, the British released her on parole after treating her wounds. Despite having her life saved by British surgeons, her wounds would never fully heal, and with no husband, she faced destitution. Who would want to marry a disabled woman? She quickly petitioned the Continental Congress for a pension. In light of her service and injuries, Congress granted her a lifetime pension, though it was only half of what a male soldier would receive. The amount would later be increased at the urging of several officers who were present at Fort Washington. It's also been suggested that Major General Henry Knox, the chief artillery officer of the Continental Army, provided Margaret with a lifelong servant to care for her after her injuries. Margaret remained on the military rolls until the war's end, being part of the Corps of Invalids, an organization created by Congress so physically wounded Continental Army soldiers could continue receiving pay. Like most others, Margaret was discharged from the service sometime in 1783. She died on January 16, 1800, 
at only 48 years old. As best as we can determine, Mary Ludwig Hayes was born on October 13th, 1754, in either Pennsylvania or New Jersey, to German immigrants. We know little about her formative years, but it's doubtful she received much, if any, formal education. In 1769, when she was 15, she married a barber, William Hayes, with whose family she had been living for some time as a domestic servant. When the Revolutionary War began, William joined the Continental Army, eventually ending up in the Pennsylvanian Artillery. Unable to live independently without her husband's income, she signed up two years later, most likely in the winter of 1777. That's all we can say, honestly, about her service. When she passed away in 1832, the local newspaper noted that she rendered efficient aid to the sick and wounded during her time in the American Revolution. She also likely helped prepare food for the troops and wash clothing and bandages. After the Revolutionary War, Mary and William moved to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where Mary gave birth to the couple's only child, John. After William died in 1786, Mary married John Macaulay in 1793. Their marriage was not happy. By 1810, Macaulay had abandoned Mary and John. On February 21st, 1822, she was awarded a pension by the Pennsylvania State Legislature. Mary Hayes died on January 22nd, 1832, aged 77. You'll probably notice that we didn't even talk about the Battle of Monmouth while recounting her life. Well, that's because there are no accounts of her actions during her lifetime. At least, they were not attributed to her or widely known. The first account of a woman handling a gun at Monmouth didn't even appear until 1830 in Joseph Plum Martin's A Narrative of Some of the Adventures, Dangers, and Sufferings of a Revolutionary Soldier. Private Martin served in the Continental Army throughout the war. His book is one of the few sources we have detailing the war from the perspective of those who fought in it, devoid of the intrigue machinations and concerns of the elite. So when talking about the Battle of Monmouth, Martin offers this titillating account about a woman joining the battle. A woman whose husband belonged to the artillery and who was then attached to a piece in the engagement attended with her husband at the piece the whole time. While in the act of reaching a cartridge and having one of her feet as far before the other as she could step a cannon shot from the enemy passed directly between her legs, without doing any other damage than carrying away all the lower part of her petticoat. Looking at it with apparent unconcern, she observed that it was lucky it did not pass a little higher, for in that case it might have carried away something else, and she continued her occupation. Notice that Martin never named the woman or claimed her husband fell, either killed or wounded. As exciting as this account may be, we aren't even sure if he was being truthful in the book. In his 2003 Amali Pitcher source book, David G. Martin hypothesizes that the story may be a variation of a common camp story, perhaps sexual in content. And Martin's account certainly has an undertone of penetration. As we discussed in our episode on Deborah Sampson, there is quite a bit of evidence men are fascinated with a woman's sexual purity, the cannonball merely passing between her legs and not carrying away something else could be an allegory to the woman retaining her chastity despite engaging in battle. Perhaps she was engaged in foreplay, but certainly not outright penetration. And as Martin posits, the story could have its origins in a sexual encounter Martin or another soldier had in camp with a camp follower. We'll never know. At any rate, Martin's book sold poorly during his lifetime. A copy would only be discovered in the 1950s. The next mention we have of a similar story, chronologically at least, is an account given by George Washington Park Custis, an adopted son of George Washington. To a newspaper in 1840, Custis recounts the following story. After a woman called Captain Molly saw her husband fall, she threw down the pail of water and crying to her dead consort, Lie there, my darling, while I avenge ye. 
grasped the ramrod, sent home the charge, and called to the gunner to prime and fire. Custis then explained how Washington met with the woman the following day to congratulate her on her heroism. That is quite a story, but at best, it's likely a family legend. At worst, it's nothing but a bold-faced lie to help cement his father's legacy. For the first time, however, the story gave the woman a name, Molly. Molly was a common nickname for women at the time. In contrast to Martin's story, however, the woman's husband was killed. This story, coming from the son of George Washington, was accepted as fact. The story by Custis was likely spread far and wide. By 1856 at the latest, the woman was identified as Mary Hayes. But we don't know how this happened. We know Hayes became Molly Pitcher because when John died in 1856, the same paper that had printed his mother's obituary published his. Whereas Mary's obituary praised her services as a nurse, John's was far different. The deceased was the son of the ever-to-be-remembered heroine, the celebrated Molly Pitcher, whose deeds of daring are recorded in the annals of the Revolution, and over whose remains a monument ought to be erected. The writer of this recollects well to have frequently seen her in the streets of Carlisle, pointed out by admiring friends thus. There goes the woman who fired the cannon at the British when her husband was killed. Notice how the editor seemingly validates the story by adding his own personal experience. It's interesting that Mary's obituary does not mention her fighting in combat, impromptu or otherwise. Once the fire had been lit, there was no containing it. As the United States prepared to celebrate its centennial, a longtime resident of Carlisle conveniently recalled an event that happened 44 years earlier. He claimed he was present at the funeral of a woman buried with full military honors. On the eve of the centennial, the leaders of Carlisle quickly raised $100 to erect a new headstone over the previously unmarked grave of Mary Hayes. As soon as the new headstone was placed, other elderly residents came forward with stories of Mary in her later years. One woman recounted that Mary once told her and a group of girls... You girls should have been with me at the Battle of Monmouth and learned how to fire a cannon. It's unlikely that this woman's story and the countless others that quickly emerged were told in bad faith. Our memories are notoriously unreliable, especially when recounting events that happened long ago. Age doesn't help either. Our brains don't record and store our memories exactly as they happened. Instead, our minds reconstruct events when we try to remember them. And just like history never happens in a vacuum, neither does recollection. Our memory of a specific event is tainted, let's say, by later and preceding memories. We inadvertently apply those experiences to the particular memory we're trying to recreate in our head to present a more coherent narrative, incorporating all the information available to us. That's why eyewitness testimony is now regarded as rather untrustworthy. By 1905, the historian John Landis used all these recovered memories to claim that Molly Pitcher was real. No imaginary heroine was Molly Pitcher, he wrote, but a real buxom lass, a strong, sturdy, courageous woman. Indeed, this real buxom lass began having physical evidence attest to her deeds. Mary's great-great-granddaughter even presented her picture to the Cumberland County Historical Society. The myth continued growing. In 1928, on the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Monmouth, Molly Pitcher, after much internal wrangling between Congress and the Postmaster General, was given an overprinted stamp. During World War II, a Liberty ship named the SS Molly Pitcher was launched in 1943. It was sunk the same year by a German U-boat. A section of U.S. Route 11 has been christened the Molly Pitcher Highway. On the New Jersey Turnpike lies the Molly Pitcher service area. But why Mary Hayes? Although Mary Hayes has been cemented as the mythical Molly Pitcher, considering Corbin and Sampson's service, it seems odd 
that this has been the case. However, the reality is that all these women are part of Molly Pitcher, yet none are truly Molly because she never was. The myth of Molly Pitcher endures because she offers a flesh and blood woman that can make her way into the textbooks. Dr. Emily J. Type, a professor of history and women's studies at Fullerton College, summarizes the contradictory process of rejection and recognition. Despite the extraordinary service of all of the Molly Pitchers in the American Revolution, the republic that was established was still a man's world. As female veterans returned to a patriarchal society where their contribution went unrewarded and largely unrecognized, only the heroic imagery of Molly Pitcher commemorated their patriotism. Despite this practice being problematic, creating a collective generic term for women in combat and non-combat roles alike is hardly unique to the American Revolution. In World War I, you had the British Canary Girls, who produced artillery shells and suffered from the effects of TNT and cordite poisoning. During World War II, you had the American Rosie the Riveter and the lesser well-known Canadian Ronnie the Bren Gun Girl, personifying the millions of American, Canadian, British, and Soviet women working in industry or in agriculture. The same applies to men in both combat and non-combat roles as well. British soldiers in both world wars were called Tommy by their allies and enemies. The nickname was derived from the mythical Private Tommy Atkins, who, when mortally wounded, told his commander that, It's all right, sir. It's all in a day's work. He then died. This story was invented by the War Office in 1815. American soldiers in the Great War were called Doughboys because the plump Americans appeared to be made of dough to the poorly fed British civilians. In the Revolution, the British regulars were known as Redcoats, while the Continental regulars were known as Yanks. The nameless thousands of men that made up the Patriot Militia are collectively known as the Minutemen. We need to remember, however, that the process of creating a collective generic term for women was not the same as it was for men. Men could stand as individuals. Heroic men, even those of common birth, could and have had their stories widely publicized, both at the time as propaganda and later in the form of historical fact and myth. From the standard bearer of the 10th Legion during Caesar's first invasion of Britain in 55 BC to Corporal Desmond Doss during the Battle of Okinawa in 1945, these personal stories humanize the collective sacrifices of millions of men. But what about the sacrifices of women? Well, women weren't supposed to play a role in combat, and they weren't expected to. Few men liked women serving as camp followers during the American Revolution or as Rosies during World War II. Even fewer liked female soldiers. Nonetheless, the sacrifices of the thousands of Molly Pitchers and the millions of Canaries, Rosies, and Ronnies still deserved their recognition in the annals of history, albeit indirectly. Thus, a wide array of stories, some truths, some half-truths, and some outright falsehoods were cobbled together to grant these anonymous women a place in history their contemporaries, sometimes grudgingly, decided they did deserve. As easy as it may be to fall for these romantic myths, however, we need to remain mindful of why they had to be created in the first place, because historians and most men deemed women unimportant and unworthy to document in any great detail. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment, and join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the only person to sign the Continental Association, the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the U.S. Constitution, Roger Sherman.